<laughs> Come on, there's got to be others out there. There's a ton of them. Cable on the Fritz called Jeb. He'll be there between 8 p.m. and next Saturday. Jeb. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know what, folks? Right now, we're going to play a clip of, not a clip, actually, we're going to play our interview with Dan Gaynor uh, from Newsbusters Media Research Center, uh, Vice President of Business and Culture for them. And uh, he's got a lot to say about media hypocrisy, the liberal media, who the liberal media is, and whether or not it is hopeless to fix the situation right now. FYI, a little behind the scenes at Behind Enemy Lines. By the way, great comment in the chat right now. Jebby Lube. Did you see that? (laughs) That is awesome. Thomas gets credit for that one. A little behind the scenes here at Behind Enemy Lines Radio. Behind, Uh, Behind Enemy Lines. Every time I run out to the store to go get something to drink or grab something to eat, Gene does these interviews without me. Just just so everybody's following along. And that's kind of how I roll because, you know, I got to carry the guest and then I got to carry Russ. It's a little too much. He's always like, oh, guess who called while you were out for five minutes. Yeah, it'd be something like Jeb Bush or something like that. <laughs> but this is already... I didn't have to carry this interview at all. In fact, Dan carried me through it. Dan Gaynor, Media Research Center, talking about the CNBC debacle. Gene Berardelli, back behind the lines, and joining me on the line right now, it's a pleasure to welcome back onto the show our good friend from uh, Media Research Center and Newsbusters, Dan Gaynor. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. It's been a real interesting time. When when media bias is your full-time job and sort of your advocation, and it becomes the national issue, the, the uh, defining issue of the presidential race, yeah, it's kind of an interesting time. Oh, you got to be licking your chops after this whole CNBC debacle. Oh, uh, well, I mean, you know, what's amazing is looking at how journalists have reacted. Because, you know, the GOP, okay, they beat them up, and journalists have had one of two reactions. If you're really far left and kooky, you know, in the journalism field, there's a lot of them. You've had the Obama reaction. Oh, my gosh, the GOP, you know, they're too afraid to even face down CNBC journalists. How would they ever handle Putin? Of course, forgetting entirely that Obama is the coward who ran away from uh, you know, people whose newspapers endorsed McCain back in 2008, kicked him off the campaign plane, and started a seven-year war with the press that's involved you know, targeting drugs, targeting Fox, even targeting CNBC, investigating reporters, tapping their phones, blocking access in the most transparent administration. So that's the that's the far left reaction. Then there's the more mainstream media reaction, as defined like by the New York Times, where oh, all those questions were legitimate, but they were kind of, to use the New York Times word, loopy. Oh, you know, it's loopy to call somebody, ask somebody if their campaign's a co- you know comic book. It's loopy to talk to somebody, tell a presidential campaign or candidate, shouldn't you resign in the midst of a debate? Loopy. No. Here is the reality. On every single issue of the day, whether it is social conservatism, foreign policy, uh, taxes, uh, you know, anything involving anything, I mean, guns, abortion, you name it, journalists are significantly, I mean, wildly far to the left, to the point where 40% of American public is conservative, self-defined according to Gallup. 34% 34% is, is moderate, and there's hardly a journalist in the country that lands in one of those two categories. Instead, they land somewhere smack dab in that little tiny 26% of liberals. So that means about 87% of America is more conservative than that. It, it reminded me of a caricature of a debate that you would see on The Simpsons or South Park or something like that. It would, there would be this whole long preface of a question, and then they would take a turn and make it even, I don't want to say loopier, but it started out loopy, and then it ended up just wildly out of context. Yeah, or it would be like, okay, you know, somebody would come on, it would be that announcer guy from The Simpsons. In fact, I could really picture this happening. You know, the, the, the guy who does those real deep voice and, you know, comes on, you know, uh, like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, we want to keep this, you know, above board and we want everything to be professional. We were here to focus on the issues. Tonight, CNBC, we're here to talk about money, what money matters to you in your life. And we're going to start with, you know, uh, Senator Rubio and, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, according to this report, I find an um, alternate and Democratic underground, you're an axe murderer. You know, uh, how much did that axe cost? I mean, that, that's, that's how you kind of picture this debate. They, not only did they run it poorly, I mean, it was really poorly, incompetently run. You would think it's a professional news network. They would at least have organization and kind of keep people coming out. It was left-wing. And then Carl Quintanilla, this was class, just didn't get a lot of attention. The very next day, after the entire nation, even liberal outlets are skewering CNBC for being a bunch of incompetent, blind hacks, you know, who are so far to the left that they're falling off the edge. Even after all of that, Carl Quintanilla comes out the next day. And one of the big news stories the very next day was that China had changed its one-child policy that had resulted in, oh, something like the deaths of 400 million babies ripped from their mother's wombs, in most cases by force, uh, forced abortion, forced murder, tyranny, despotism, abuse. He comes out, when his story comes out, he tweets out on Twitter, well, it worked. Oh, dear Lord. I mean, that's like summarizing something that is, you know, what, um, I, you know, something in the order of 60 times the Holocaust and saying, well, it worked. Unreal. I mean, what a monster, what a, what a despicable piece of gutter slime to type that. And yet it didn't make a blip because the media don't care. You can say anything very far left and get away with it. The only time, don't embarrass the profession, don't be really ridiculous, which is what CNBC did. Well, it's amazing. You say don't embarrass the profession. What would it take? If that doesn't embarrass the profession, what would it take to embarrass the profession? Yeah, that did. That went beyond. When, when the New York Times is calling a, new, a news network, you know, saying it committed, it had loopy questions. Yeah, that embarrassed the, the media. But they don't want to make a single change. Not one change. The reality is this. This is a GOP debate. GOP is, generally speaking, considered to be more conservative than Democrats. Liberals dominate the media field. Why are they involved in the debate whatsoever? I mean, literally, why are they involved? Why are they asking any questions? Oh, because we want to get on those networks. Trust me, you'll get on those networks. I can, you know, I can get fired from my job today and go and negotiate a better contract because there's the deal. If there, any of those networks ever want to be part and party to a general election debate involving the Democrat and the Republican, then they'd have to cover this debate. And they'd have to sit there, and maybe somebody from their network could read the questions or just control the time or something like that. But they wouldn't be given one iota of power. And that's what's happened. And that's, and honestly, that's why there's the big reaction of all the Republican candidates. That's why Rice Priebus cut off NBC at the knees. But there's still, I mean, remember, we are only a couple years past Candy Crowley trying to fix the presidential election in 2012. We are only a few years more past from Dan Rather trying to fix the George Bush election. The media have it in for the GOP. It's undisputable. I don't care what journalists say. Overwhelmingly liberal, overwhelmingly vote Democratic. Uh, the, the lie in the debate clearly said, is there anybody... Anybody out there, you know, among the, the Italians who's going to vote for Republicans? No. So why should that party, you know, deal with them? Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the issue Republicans have to decide. But meanwhile, I think it is fair for every American, liberal and conservative, moderate, far left, far right, whatever your stripe is, to want the media out of controlling who becomes president. Because that's what, in the final analysis, that's what we are talking about. The major media want to decide who becomes president of the United States. They've been doing it for years. Uh, did you see the Joe Scarborough rant yesterday? I, I did. Why don't you tell everybody about it? Uh, it was it was fantastic. I I have had words with Joe Scarborough enough that he blocks me on Twitter. Okay, so if I am singing his praises, it's pretty much a compelling thing. What he did, he went, did a nine minute rant about media bias, pointing out that the problem is not just the debates. 
The problem is not just the election. It is that journalists all are liberal as a collective entity. Not every single one. But, I mean, even somebody like Jake Tapper, who is more fair than, you know, nine out of ten journalists you're going to find on network TV, certainly. Um, but he's liberal. You know, journalists are liberal. They are married to liberals. They party with liberals. They are, they, I mean, Chuck Todd. Chuck Todd worked for Senator Harkin. Chuck Todd's wife was, was a consultant for Jim Webb. I, you know, George Stephanopoulos, the biggest joke in American journalism. I mean, what a fraud. What a complete and utter lying fraud to call that man a journalist. And, and did you see the tweet that he put out? Talk about a lack of self-recognition talking about uh, Reince Priebus and uh, losing control over the Republican debates. Uh, I couldn't believe uh, the tweet that he put out. Uh, but, yeah, they're all absolutely in it together almost. But, okay, let me give a counter-argument to this just so we can try to be a little objective and try to analyze it a little deeper. Media is a business. And if you want to run it like a business, you have to attract an audience. But then the question becomes if what we say is true and, you know, let, let, let's say that over 50% of people are either consider themselves conservative or, or moderate, why, why is it media catering to that audience to try to grab more market share? It seems like a counterintuitive business model even, even if you give them the credit to say, okay, media is a business and you're trying to build an audience. It's just counterintuitive to me. Right, but see, there is such a thing as a monopoly. And historically speaking, for what once with the advent of TV and then the gradual decline of daily papers and markets, uh, media created a monopoly in this country. Cities that had, back 100 years ago, had eight daily newspapers, a labor paper, a business paper, a legal paper, a tabloid, a this, a that, uh, evolved to the point where when I started in journalism, my city, Baltimore, had an evening newspaper, Baltimore News American, that I ended up working at, and a morning and evening paper attached to the Baltimore Sun that were operated independently. There's now one. Uh, so so that, that's a monopoly. That one, the company that owns that, Tribune, also owns all the community weeklies. Uh, you know, they are the dominant player in that market. Uh, you know, you can have now with the internet and cable, we have some other channels, some other outlets, but there is what business people call, and I've got an MBA, so that I know what I'm talking about here, they call first mover advantage. ABC, CBS, and NBC were the first movers in TV. A lot of people simply watch them even though now they have a lot of choices. And those are all consistently run by liberals. They didn't have to embrace conservatism because they didn't have any, any reason to. They, it was liberal, liberal, liberal. Walter Cronkite, Huntley and Brinkley, you know, Edward R. Murrow, take your pick. All liberal. Every line you know, of you know, Helen Thomas. Uh, we find later in their careers, Helen Thomas, Walter, Walter Cronkite was trying to run on the Democratic ticket as vice president. He was negotiating, trying to run that. He, Helen Thomas, so far to the kooky left that eventually her career crashes and burns. But she was the, the queen of Washington journalism for decades. So they didn't have anything challenging them. Fox came on board. Fox, in a lot of ways, is not anywhere near, other than the talking head shows, which are great, and, you know, Megyn Kelly or Hannity or O'Reilly, et cetera. Other than those, Fox is the most neutral news network out there. But what the media hate is that Fox actually puts conservatives on, and they don't. They don't have anything to do. They don't even understand what conservatives are. A, a few years ago, when Van Jones got into all the controversy, because for people who don't remember, Van Jones, the, the climate czar for the Obama administration, he had signed a 9-11 truth or petition. Well, this blew up. Conservatives were making a big deal about it. And eventually he resigned at midnight on a Saturday night so that media wouldn't talk about it. Next day, the New York Times ran a story and said, oh, this guy resigned. They had never run a story up to that point. That, you know, at one point in time, there was, I can't remember what the issue was, where the New York Times said they were going to commit one person to kind of monitor the conservative movement. It's 40% of America. 85% of 
America considers themselves religious, you'd have you you could swing a dead cat in his room and not hit somebody who goes to church. You know, this is they they have had a monopoly of power to control. Everything.